Why? Because Mark Zuckerberg and his wife have created one of the biggest foundations for vaccines. CO2 is not a pollutant. And if, if CO2 levels go below, you know, 180, all life on earth dies. So we we have fake science, fake problems, pushed out to the fake media. And that's why I think my running for Senate is gonna be, and, and winning is important because it's gonna be historic because Massachusetts, the one mile radius between MIT and Harvard is the center of the center of the deep state. Every evil starts in the one mile radius between MIT and Harvard. And I know these guys, I've figured them out. Hey friends, just a quick word from Virtual Shield. Are you using a VPN to watch this video? Well, if you're not, you should. Keep in mind that Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, and Bill Gates are some of the creepiest dudes on the planet, and many of you are willingly letting them know everything about you on a daily basis. And the only real protection against these digital tyrants is the use of a VPN. A VPN is a virtual private network. It's a server where you log on before you browse the internet and it basically masks or hides your identity. Sign up for a free 30-day trial of Virtual Shield VPN mobile and desktop app and it will shield your browsing activity from the prying eyes of Big Brother, whether on a public Wi-Fi connection, in a foreign country, or at home. Here, let me show you how easy it is. You just go to virtualshield.com or the Google Play Store and download the Virtual Shield free 30-day trial install it and click connect. Now that I'm connected, my IP address is one coming out of Chicago and I don't live anywhere near Chicago, Illinois. In honor of the unexpected passing of one of the NBA's all-time greats, this month Virtual Shield is offering 24% off all VPN plans and all premium add-ons. So sign up for a free 30-day trial to Virtual Shield VPN and see what the hype's about. You have nothing to lose and your privacy to keep. I'll leave the link below this video. And let's begin. Friends, thank you so much for tuning in. I've got a real treat for you here. I've never interviewed this man before, but uh, it's about time. His name is Dr. Shiva Ayodore. He's got a PhD from MIT. He's invented many, many cool things, including email, believe it or not. We're gonna talk about that and so much more. As I'm looking at the news today, the CDC is warning coronavirus is coming to the United States and will be a tremendous public health threat. We have gotta keep our eye on that story. And ask the question, are they going to roll out a vaccine and make it mandatory? So much spooky stuff going on. Dr. Shiva, thanks for joining us. Sure, great to be here. Good to have you. Hey, can you tell people a little bit about your background? I mean, it's vast. It's really interesting. You've invented email, uh, multiple PhDs. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. You're a biological engineer, correct? Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I, I'm basically a working class kid from Jersey. You know, I grew up there playing baseball, mowing lawns. Uh, you know, painting homes. I did all sorts of everyday things, you know, uh, but I also learned how to program software when I was uh, a young kid, around 12, 13, 14 years old. And that journey also, so, so my, you know, my entire life in the United States really starts in New Jersey, but I also had a previous journey before to that. You know, I emigrated here from India as a seven-year-old kid, um, and those memories are still pretty, you know, uh, deep, you know, I grew up in Bombay, India, but I also grew up in a small village in deep South India, where my grandmother was and grandparents were farmers, um, you know, subsistence farmers working for 16 hours a day in the field. But on weekends, um, my grandmother was a village healer and she took it very seriously. You know, uh, 30, 40 people would show up at her home, you know, outside. She would observe their face. She could figure out what was going on in their particular organ systems. And then she would come up with different types of formulations for them, you know, the right medicine for the right person at the right time. And so I, I saw this woman with tattoos all over her arms without any degrees, you know, really uh, provide a lot of healing. And it was all empirical, some, you know, Western medicine will call it anecdotal, but it was quite profound. So that really led, you know, to my interest in medicine. But I also grew up in an India which had a caste system. Some people may be aware of it. I guess the closest is think about the blue bloods of Boston, right? who think they're the snobs and they know better than everyone else. India has that uh, probably in some ways had it formalized, which was called the caste system. And we were considered the untouchables, sort of the, the, the bottom, quote unquote, on the bottom. So the fact that my parents even made it here in 1970 is quite extraordinary and really tells a lot about who they are. Right. So, but anyway, I grew up in Jersey. Um, and by the time I was 14, because of the background that I came from, I really saw America as an amazing opportunity. And I saw how much my parents struggled. So in many ways, I honored them and I worked hard. And by the time I was 14, I'd finished up calculus uh, in ninth grade. My high school had no other courses. And I was very fortunate 
my mother saw this little article in a New York newspaper which said that there was a professor at, rec at a New York University who was going to select 40 students. This is in 78 now. And those students would have the opportunity to study a, an intensive computer science program. And so I was lucky I got selected and my mom would drop me off in Newark, which is a train station. As a 14 year old kid, I take it into um, New York, graduated top of the class. And then after I finished, it was an intensive summer Navy SEAL type, really intense program. I came back and my, I had some high school courses left. And then I got introduced to a, uh, a, a scientist at what is now known as Rutgers Medical School, Dr. Les Michelson. And Les is still, the, now he's the head of high performance computing at Rutgers. And he saw talent in me and, and my willingness to work hard. He said, look, I'll let you work here. Um, uh, you you'll be treated as a professional. Everyone in the lab there was probably 30, 40, 50 years older than me, uh, 60 years older than me. And he goes, you'll be given, uh, you know, and we'll give you different projects. One of the projects was to use my computing capabilities to look at data. Uh, at that time, Rutgers working with Modern Fury Hospital in New York, had some of the best data on why babies were dying in their sleep, sleep pattern data. Oh, SIDS. SIDS, yeah. And so the idea was, could you look at 48-hour sleep data? Babies, by the way, have six states of sleep. And could you correlate that and predict when the baby you know, has an apnea, you know, where it stops breathing? So that was one of the projects I worked on. In fact, that resulted in a paper that I later published in, at one of the big medical conferences. In parallel to that, I had this very other interesting opportunity that was granted to me. You know, in those days, if you go back to 1978, you know, in these big organizations, a medical school or universities or any major organization, there were two methods of communication. People may remember the old line landline phone, right? Right. The other was the inner office mail system, which was really the social media fabric of communications, which means in every office, if there was a doctor or a researcher, they always had a woman who was a secretary. She sat outside of his office or, you know, that another office space. She had a desk and, there, and she, on that desk, she had an inbox, an outbox, physical, you know, boxes. Carbon uh, copies. Folders. Yeah, she had carbon paper. I she remember had little, it. Oops. Yeah, she had a big uh, typewriter. So she'd click away and she'd write this thing called the memo. The memo was the medium of organization in offices. The memo had very typic, uh, typical structure. It had memorandum, to, from, subject. You could add a carbon uh, paper if you wanted to send it to another person that was called a CC, or sometimes you blind CC'd someone. And this memo, sometimes you had an attachment with a paper clip. So if I was gonna hire you, I'd say, I'm thinking of hiring, blah, blah, blah. I'd like to, and I would CC my boss, attach your resume, and I'd circulate it around the office and people would provide comments, right? That's how business got done. It was, it was a medium for business and, and if you were applying for grants. I was asked to convert that entire complicated system not simply exchanging text messages, those old mainframes, you could do simple like Morse code, you know, short text messages, but not this, what I'm talking about. And I was asked to convert that entire system to the electronic form. And it, it became sort of the, you know, uh, it was a labor of love. I used to, you know, work until two, three in the morning. And I wrote 50,000 lines of code in a, in a, in a program called, in a language called Fortran, which wasn't designed for text. And, uh, I created all these features. My customers were these secretaries, who, by the way, the, the, the old men in their lab coats thought these people were in some ways inferior, right? They could never move from the uh, typewriter to the keyboard. But to me, they became my customers. I learned all their features, what they wanted. And, um, and I called that, I named that system email, a term never used before in the English language. It wasn't an obvious term. Um, if there, and the only reason I called it that is the operating system only allowed five characters, you know? Hmm. Um, and it was an uppercase because of Fortran language, everything was written in uppercase. And, uh, and then I won one of the Westinghouse Science Awards, which was considered one of the baby nobles of that time. And then this was before I came to MIT. When I came to MIT, they listed three interesting people out of the 1,041 students, and this was in September of 81, who had done something, done something of note, and I was one of the kids listed there for inventing this email system. And I didn't think a lot about it. I was always brought up to be a very humble Indian kid. Um, and in fact, that year, I went to the president's house because I was elected student body president. And he said, Shiva, you know, you, it's unfortunate the Supreme Court doesn't recognize software patents. Uh, he was Reagan's advisor at the time. 
and he said, you should copyright it. Because in 1980, which I didn't know, the Copyright Act of 1976, which only protected you know, music and written work, was also amended to become the Software Act of 1980, so you could, you could use copyright law to protect software. Okay, so I wrote away for all the papers, got it, submitted it. My parents weren't lawyers. I did it on my own on August 30th, 1982. I was given the first US copyright for email, officially recognizing me as the inventor of email, given that was the only way to protect invent software inventions. So that's the story of the invention of email. Um, never promoted it. You know, there was a newspaper clipping that came out of the local newspaper. Um, then I, you know, went on to MIT. I was very, remember, I was very interested in medicine. Even when I was working at that institute, it was always an interest in medicine. In some ways, the email project was a, was a nice distraction. Um, but I found out that, you know, in medicine, um, I, uh, Western medicine treats the body as parts, right? Uh, the, they don't look at the ankle bones connected to the foot bone. Right. There's a reason for this. So I ended up going in and out of MIT, as I shared, did four degrees, my PhD in a field called biological engineering, my undergraduate in electrical engineering and computer science, went and started a company, came back, ended up doing two master's degrees, one in you know, design. I actually do a ton of graphic design and visual design out of the MIT Media Lab. And I also got another master's in uh, applied mechanics, mechanical engineering. And then I went started a company, interesting enough, again in email. <laughs> In 93, if you remember during 78 when I invented email in 93, email was really used, you, you may remember this, it was really an office application. Right. right? People used to set up local area networks um, and people created other you know, variants on what I had done, but it was in the office theme. But in 93, if you remember what happened was a World Wide Web came, which really put a front end on the internet, uh, a web-based front end. And so a lot of these email programs started appearing in the web-based front end, like Gmail and Yahoo and AOL, right? And so email went from being an office application to becoming a consumer application in 93. And you see this explosive growth in email. Um, and at that time, interesting enough, my PhD work was in a field of AI called pattern analysis. In some ways, AI is a subfield of, of pattern analysis. And I was looking at a ways to analyze all different kinds of patterns, be it, you know, ultrasonic signal, be it a speech pattern, be it handwriting and documents. And I was coming across this general theory of pattern analysis. And I was, I built all these very nice tools. And in, in 93, I got a call from a guy who said, Hey, look, you should participate in a contest. The white house is sponsoring. So 93, what was happening was this email volume was exploding. One of the first people to recognize the pains of email was the U S white house. And that's when Clinton was there. The White House, before when print mail came, you know, they would read the email by hand. You know, people would read it and they had 147 different buckets and they would figure out the right form letter and they would respond to that, okay, by hand. But when email came, they're getting 5,000 emails a day. It's doubling every month. Mm -hmm. They would print out those emails and again, try to use that same system. It, it, was, it was untenable. So they were looking for technologies that could automatically read an email and categorize it. Long story short, I ended up winning that competition, um, was the only graduate student to participate, beat out five other public companies, left MIT because my lawyer said, look, you could always do your PhD, but there's a big business opportunity. So I left. And the idea was, could you go to companies, tell them, look, you send us your email, our system will analyze it, figure out. And by then I'd filed some interesting patents for the attitude of the email, the issues in the email. And that ended up, so I ended up getting AT&T as a customer, Nike and Citigroup, and we built that to around a $250 million value company. We became the premier company. When, when I, def, I created the field called email management to solve the problem that email caused, you know? Mm, yeah. So uh, you're a real slouch is what you're saying. You've been lazy your whole well, life. You haven't accomplished anything. I, you're making us all feel guilty for not working harder, I got to tell you. One of the things I just want to share real quickly with the audience here, though, is uh, we neglected to say you're also running for U.S. Senate, I believe in Massachusetts, and you're a champion of health and freedom. When I say that, I'm talking about the vaccine program. You believe the entire vaccine program should probably be thrown out, and you just recently were in Connecticut educating legislators about vaccines and freedom, uh, freedom of choice, freedom to not get right. injected. So I want to talk about that too. I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, 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 uh, not to just want to give the audience that background. Yeah, yeah. So I think the important thing is there's this one journey. You're looking at the you know MIT PhD scientist, uh, the inventor, but there's another journey which which it's good to remind me of, I've always been a fighter and because, and I'll, I'll talk about that, but 
after the invention of Echomail, you know, that crump company grew beautifully. In 2003, and I was managing 300 people, I, I went back to MIT and an advisor of mine said, Shiva, you got to come back and, you know, you really love medicine. That's really your first love. You've done great at computing. Why don't you come back and finish your PhD? And I said, why? He said, look, in 2003, something interesting had happened, and this comes back to the health area, is that the genome project had just ended in 2003, and we found out that, you know, we thought before the genome project started in two, uh, 1994, we thought a human being had around uh, a million genes, right, in 93. We knew a worm only had about 2,000 genes. But guess what happens in 2003? After all this work, we find out we only have 20,000 genes, okay? Um, so human beings and the worm, just to correct myself, worms have 20,000 genes. We found out human beings and worm have the same number of protein coding genes, 20,000 genes. So this changed biology because a biologist wrongly assumed that complexity, you know, we're supposedly more complex than a worm, must be the number of parts, right? More parts, more complexity. Turns out we have the same number of parts. So this flipped biology in a very, on its head and people said, wait a minute, it's not the number of genes, but it's all the chemical interactions, right? Because genes give rise to proteins. It's, you know, I could give you, let's say 10 balls, right? You could connect them in different ways. You could just connect them one after the other, or you could create beautiful shapes. It's the connections that matter. So I came back in 2003 uh, to pursue the integration of all my experience in computing, and biology, and that resulted in a creation of a new technology called Cytosolve, C-Y-T-O-S-O-L-V-E. By the way, if you guys want to know more about this, you can go to my website, vashiva.com. You know, I have all the stuff I've created up there. But Cytosolve, really, I created it because I looked at the way that medicines were being created in Western medicine. In many ways, you know, you test something in a test tube, then you go kill a bunch of animals for five, 10 years, then you go test on human beings for another five years, pharma company spends $5 billion, the stuff that comes out is also toxic. Um, the, whole, the whole model, even pharma knows that the drug development model is broken. For me, go, going back to India, I saw you know, how natural products could heal people, how my grandmother would formulate. I was like, wow, with Cytosolve, I could do two things. I could help reduce you know, toxicity and safety in the drug environment because with my technology, I could literally model the human cell on the computer. I could model cancer on the computer. I could model all different kinds of Alzheimer's on the computer. And with that, we could test medicines on the computer long before you, you know, herd animals and humans. And so that's Cytosol, which is what I run today. And Cytosol's grown beautifully. We actually, to show pharma guys we could compete with them, we did a test project where we actually discovered a two combination drug on the computer for pancreatic cancer, mixing uh, you know, what would take them forever to do, trillions of combinations. And we actually got it allowed by the FDA just to show that we could do what they do, but better. So that's sort of the journey, you know, from the invention standpoint. I also have another company that I do that we integrate Eastern and Western medicine to re-educate both sides of the world that the body's really a system, that's called systems health. But in parallel to all of this stuff, as you shared about, I've always had a real um, uh, disgust for people who, uh, you know, create hierarchies, who oppress people, the state, you know, so if you go back to MIT, you'll see a picture of me burning the South African flag on the steps of MIT, organizing food service workers, fighting to make sure more everyday people could go there. Um, uh, I, I, I use this technology I just talked about, Cytosol, to expose Monsanto. We, we expose how genetic engineering of soy actually will downregulate glutathione, which is an antioxidant, create formaldehyde. And um, when I was in India for two years during my Fulbright, uh, before I was leaving, I was appointed to be the head of one of the largest scientific institutions, and I exposed corruption. There it was a big whistleblowing thing. Had to leave India under death threat. So what I'm saying is, in parallel to all these other interesting things I enjoy doing, I've always been a fighter um, throughout this. One of my mentors was a guy called Noam Chomsky. Um, you know, some people may know about him. I mean, no, I don't agree with everything Noam says, but Noam had a way of looking at political history, and so that's always been with me. So. Where all of this converged was in 2016, uh, when Trump uh, ran. You know, for the first time, I never believed in electoral politics. Here, I saw a guy really going after both parties. At least he didn't stop even after he got on the debate stage. Most people sort of, you know, pussyfoot out and they stopped doing that. So I registered as an independent, voted for him, and then in February of 2017, I said I was going to run as a Republican in Massachusetts. Did that, 
Uh, and the Republican establishment was so afraid of me, an outsider, they threw a dope to run against me. We'd actually photoshopped a picture with Trump, okay? But so we ran as independents. We, and, and I found campaigning was cool because it was another innovation. We built our own technology to support it. In fact, the technology that I used many years before I had sold to the Bush campaign uh, to really, you know, understand voters, message, et cetera. But in, well, but in the last campaign, we ended up running against Elizabeth Warren uh, with a message, you know, only the real Indian can defeat the fake Indian. And it wasn't about race. It was really about her lack of integrity. And uh, the GOP establishment and the Democrats colluded against us to not even put me on the debate stage, which was illegal. And just to give you, an, at the, the net of it was we got about 100,000 votes, five times more than any U.S. Senate candidate in Massachusetts history, was polling at around 60% 60, 60 visibility, 10% favorability, um, more than any candidate. And we did this with, you know, $200,000 and, and the technology I built. So that is, you know, my activism journey. When we decided to run in this campaign, which is coming up, I'm running as a Republican, one of the big issues that came up was vaccines, you know? I got a call about a, a, a year ago to come down to Florida. And my area of research is the immune system. My PhD work was in that, et cetera. And when I went to speak, um, one of the guys in the, who's been fighting this is Andy Wakefield. And I gave a talk and I said, look, I don't know, I have to study the history of vaccines, but I can tell you something doesn't make sense here. And what I shared with Wakefield was I said, Andy, you guys have been fighting this for 10, 15 years, but there's no science here. You need to bring in back the science. So what I've been doing over the last year is we've actually, uh, you can see a bunch of my videos, we started educating people about the immune system, you know, making it easy, simple diagrams. Um, and uh, the main focus that emerges out of this is, is the interconnection, uh, which is an area that I really have been uh, uh, articulating, is the interconnection between freedom, truth, and health, right? So what's happening in the world today is you constrain freedom, um, which means you stop discourse, you stop debate, you stop, uh, and by the way, uh, you stop free speech, truthful free speech. You can say stuff, but be ready to also get sued if you say garbage, you know? Oh, and by the way, I'd like to add that True News has just been banned, terminated from YouTube. True News, Rick Wiles, good people doing good research, good, uh, good reporting, yeah. uh, was invited to Davos by the Trump team to cover Davos. So Trump is well aware of True News and that entire channel, a very popular big YouTube channel, was just terminated from the platform. So I'm so yeah. sick and tired. I know you talk about power, profit, and control. Uh, we need to take back the narratives. And uh, we are sort of winning that truth war, which is why you see them acting like fascists in banning channels like True News. It's just disgusting. Yeah, they, they, the, the issue is they, the issue is, remember, media is propaganda. So media presents certain narratives. So when they ban these things, it's that they don't want certain propaganda out there. And, and what's interesting is about uh, going, you know, since you brought up the issue of censorship, which is related to this vaccine issue, by the way, you know, in 1997, when I was running my other company, Echo Mail, which was a company that could do email analysis, I went to the Postal Service because 1997 is an important year. You know why? Because that's when email volume overtook postal mail volume. Hmm. And I've been a big student of the Postal Service and communications. And you know, obviously, as the inventor of email, I, I looked at what was going on. And I met with the Postal Service executives. And I advised them, you know, for free. I said, look, you guys should be offering a public email service. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, look, you're not in the uh, postal mail business. You guys are in the communications business. And, uh, and I said, look, when Franklin and the founders set up the postal mail system, it was designed it was set up so you and I could freely communicate because the crown was suppressing, you know, newsletters and news press. So the notion of the postal service, which most Americans have forgotten, is was set up to really be the infrastructure to enable the First Amendment. So I could send you a letter, you could send me a letter, right? And very few people know the postal service has its own police force run by the inspector general. So if anyone interferes, with that letter, it's 20 year sentence in prison, okay? And so up until, so you know, you had Tory mail, we, you had all different mail going through it, right? In fact, up until 1970, nearly 60 to 70% of the mail through the United States Postal Service was political mail, right wing mail, left wing mail, KKK, Green Party, everyone, you know? Mm -hmm. It was really the vehicle where we were all the press through physical postal mail. So in 19, 
97, when I saw this, I said, Jesus, this is going to be a real attack on democracy because now you had a few companies, right? Gmail, Hotmail, and most people don't read their privacy statements in that so-called free mail, free email they were getting. They own your email. And the Postal Service looked at me, I was 29 at the time, they said, yeah, you know, you're a nice kid. You know, we're bigger than Walmart. We run, we have a half a, half a million employees. We don't want to be in this, you know, this email business, okay? Fast forward to 2011, if you look on the front pages around, I think, the fall time, the Postal Service announces they're going bankrupt. So I wrote a scathing, I gave a scathing interview to Fast Company in time, and I said, look, these guys should listen to me. I have a solution. They could make billions of dollars by, you know, providing digital services. And it was such a blistering attack. The inspector general, not the postmaster general runs the postal service, but the inspector general who audits him called me. And he said, Sheila, I want to uh, understand what you're talking about. Why are you attacking us? Anyway, he commissioned me to write two reports. I was paid really well. And I showed them how they could make billions by offering a public mail service and the email management and a nut more billions if they got into a range of digital services. They, and you know, that was delivered and they never did anything. When the Trump administration, when I said, look, I have the actual solution. It's not gonna be through freaking regulation. You know, these guys will talk circles around you. The postal service needs to come to the 21st century and do their freaking job. The postal service doesn't do their job. They're supposed to give us the services of, imagine the postal service charging you 50 bucks you got email, video, Facebook, all those things, equivalents, right? No one can take that away from you. It's guaranteed by the Constitution. You could write whatever you want. And you could, right? And, I, and so that's the service. That's the real solution. I did a video on this. But so if you look at the vaccine thing, you put up something on vaccines, Facebook can take it down. Why? Because Mark Zuckerberg and his wife have created one of the biggest foundations for vaccines. All right? So you have a... A small set of people, Google, Facebook, the five major, three major telcos, AT&T, uh, Vodafone, and Verizon, which really control the hardware and the software on ramps. So the other piece of the solution, which I proposed, was we should have mesh networks. You know, you could easily put up an antenna on your house. In fact, the postal locations could, and we create a people's network. This is the only way out of this. And I've said this over and over again, but Trump has a lot of unfortunate people around him who don't get the solution out there. So what I'm saying is there is a real solution and the inventor of email who invented email actually is a solution for big tech censorship. I so think that's, to- it's so interesting. I didn't know that about the U.S. Postal Service. I mean, I guess I did, um, but uh, I needed to be reminded of that history. And it's so interesting if they would have acted when you suggested they did, they could have been really first to market and built uh, something really huge to protect our money. constitutional rights. And instead, right. we've given everything to Google. You, you'll appreciate this. Listen to this. You may already know this. The CEO of YouTube is Susan Wojcicki. Hmm. Susan Wojcicki's sister is Ann Wojcicki, who is the CEO of 23andMe. And she is married to Sergey Brin, who was, uh-huh. uh, yeah. I mean, it's just so incestuous. So you've got YouTube yeah. deplatforming true news. You've got Google, you've got Google deranking SGT reports. So my news doesn't come up. I used to be uh, in the top 7,000 uh, websites in the United States. That's no more. Uh, so they, it's a rigged game. It's an absolute rigged game. Oh, well, let me yes. ask you this. Let me ask you this. Where do you stand on Section 230? Shouldn't President Trump, shouldn't the Republicans do something about this fascist tyranny, the censorship? YouTube and the rest, they all hide behind Section The entire national vaccine program should go away because it's a top two reasons, three reasons. First, it's a top-down model. Uh, second, the science that was used in 1962 and still used today for vaccination is a 50 to 100-year-old science, and you're talking to one of the experts who can talk to that. Right. Third, well, let me- there is no- Oh, go ahead. Sure, sure. There is no risk assessment or vaccine safety standards at all established. So you have three reasons. And meanwhile, you have activists, activists misleading other mothers, telling, oh, my God, we got to work with the legislators to retain these exemptions. It's like you're fighting for freaking crumbs. We need a, a, this. This is a much bigger thing, because what we're talking about is the entire 1962 act needs to go away. So you have one Kennedy trying to preserve another Kennedy as Band-Aid and that Kennedy put in a Band-Aid for an act that never should have gone. Now, to give John Kennedy the benefit of the doubt, I think he was sincere, and he probably thought these scientists were telling the truth, right? But the 1986 vaccine injury program should never have been done, and right now the movement is struggling for crumbs. Now, when I gave this hearing, it was wonderful in Connecticut, 
was it blew everyone away. People had, the legislators had tremendous number of questions you can see it on. And I had so many people come up to me and they said, Shiva, thank you so much. You know, we thought you, you know, we, we didn't like you initially, or some of them attacking Bobby, but we get it. You know, there is controlled opposition in these movements and you address the heart of the issue. And, and one mother came up and she said, who's one of the head of informed choice, she goes, you know, your talk flipped two of the legislators on our behalf. The problem again gets back to this issue. In American politics, we have professional activists who do not know science, who do not know engineering, uh, lawyers primarily involved. The founders of this country were not lawyers, you know? They were people who worked. And in the modern day world, we need to understand how stuff works so we can understand how to fight it. And so in the five months, you know, uh, you know, with my involvement in this, I think that with all humility, we really started educating people. What is the immune system? The fact that it's the, the model of vaccination used today is, is, you know, 100 years old. It's using an old model of science. And that is bridging the gap where we're able to bring people over who really may have just thought, oh yeah, vaccines are great. It's not that issue. And the freedom issue is important because once you start mandating something to something as complex as someone's immune system and not decentralizing this back to the patient doctor relationship. And that's what I spoke to the legislators. I said, look, this problem is too freaking complex. And I believe most doctors probably went into it with uh, good intentions. You know, they are actually good people. Decentralize healthcare back to the edges, right? Not centralize it. And I think it was a very good testimony. I think we've really moved the needle in Connecticut um, the day before. Well, that's great. Uh, as you know, uh, SB 277 was passed uh, in California, and that's mandatory vaccination. So the state wants to claim ownership of your child in your child's body. It's absolute insanity. I thought that SB 277 would cause a revolution in California. It hasn't. We see similar things happening in New Jersey. You spoke up in Connecticut, but can I ask you something? I was actually in Jersey too, yeah. Yeah, that's true. And uh, but So as we see this tyrannical tiptoe uh, coming after our God-given rights, our constitutional rights of sovereignty over our own bodies. I want to ask you something. Given your uh, vast historical knowledge and education, eugenics, you know all about eugenics. You know what that is and what it means. As you look, and by the way, I think people are waking up to the science. People are waking up and reading the labels. So I want to talk about ingredients. As you look at the list of ingredients in vaccines, things like formaldehyde, aborted fetal tissues, Mercury, thimerosal as a preservative. Um, what else is in there? I believe aspartame. Some of these ingredients, it's, I've said before, it's like a real witch's brew. And they want to shoot this into the, our children's bloodstreams. You talked about the caste system. Do you think it's possible that those that uh, control this industry are using it to harm our children on purpose? Yeah, look, uh, you know, I, I spoke about the coronavirus in a video I did. Look, the history of, of um, people in power using biological biologics or biological warfare to go after an enemy um, goes back to 600 BC. You can see it. You know, there's a, in, in, there's a video I did. Going, so the notion of, so the broad notion of people in power using, you know, biology to go attack their own people goes back a long time. Okay. Recent times, ancient times. So the issue is, um, do the people in power see us as their enemy, right? What do they see us as? So if that's the case, anything is possible, right? What people use to oppress and suppress people. So this is, you know, just in some ways, it, and from a very objective way, definitely. So that's why if you look at what's going on, I'll tell you something that I do believe, and, and I put it there as a question. If you look at what's going on in China, okay, China, here's a, about what is 1.4 billion people. Um, if you just go, if you just, Go look at the news about what six months ago, uh, Hong Kong, you know, people are protesting there, right? Massive. This is a major issue for China because in China, if you protest, you get shot, right? It's, or you get thrown in jail. What people don't know about is in Wuhan, everyone should go look this up. In Wuhan, which is the city in the Hubei province, right, where the coronavirus was first detected, right. um, what people don't understand is six months before that, there were massive protests in Wuhan. Did you know that? No, I did not. You know what they were for? They were for clean air, okay? See, everyone thinks the Chinese people are, you know, they're like, 
China, I have a lot of friends of mine in India who go to uh, teach yoga in China. Chinese love to be healthy. They want a better life for their kids, okay? China has a massive garbage problem. They have so much garbage, they don't know what to do with it. So they, are, they want to build these massive incinerator plants, which put up so much toxic fumes. And by the way, the Paris Accords allows them to pollute like crazy. So in the Wuhan city, they were going to build one of the biggest incinerator plants. And people are, first of all, there's toxic air already in China. And the citizens were so upset, they had massive protests. They were willing to risk their lives because that's what happens in China. Ten, tens of thousands, at least reported, were protesting. And the last news I heard was like in late mid-July, uh, the Chinese government or news came out that they decided to stop the incinerator plants. We don't really know what happened. But what I can tell you is that is where the virus first showed up, right? Now imagine you as a centralized economy, the Chinese government, you have Hong Kong from your standpoint going up in flames, you're gonna lose it. And in, in Wuhan, and by the way, Wuhan has a whole history going back to Mao's times of people 500,000 people were for Mao, 500,000 people were against him. So it's a very interesting state, uh, a region. So here people are rising up for clean air, for anti-pollution riots. And suddenly the virus shows up there. And if you look at some of these people being thrown in, if you watch some of the videos. I know, it's a perfect excuse look. to round up dissidents. Absolutely. Exactly. And, and exactly. notice too that the Hong Kong protests are now, you know, those have, been as, those, those have been, those have died down as well. Yeah, so you have, you know, Steve, you know, I've met Steve Ben, he's a nice guy, but look, he's talking about pandemic, pandemic, you know. He doesn't get the point here. The Chinese government is, will use anything on its enemy, like has been going on for, for you know, since 600 BC. So they view their people as enemies. They're stepping out of line. So, and what's interesting with this virus is there's 1,500. Yeah, the pandemic, the, that's, they want us to talk about pandemic, right? That's not the freaking issue here. The issue here is the immune system, by the way, is quite strong. It can withstand a lot. This virus is very similar to the SARS virus, okay? Except for around 1,500 nucleotides. And if you, from a biological engineering standpoint, that virus, has a much stickier level relationship to the cell surface through one of the AC2 receptors. This is one of the theories that I've, you know, it's emerging. So bottom line, it has a higher infectivity rate, okay? Right. Total spread, but a low mortality rate, okay, 2%. But the issue here is that's not even the point. The point is the two biggest protests that China, and there may have been more, are off the pages. They have an amazing excuse. We don't hear about Hong Kong. We don't hear about... Very few. I mean, the New York Times had one article in there about the Wuhan thing, and I started looking at this. And when you connect the dots, this is the Chinese government. I, I call it a term, biomedia warfare, where biology and media are being integrated. So the media is talking, they have the media talking about pandemic, 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 right? You know, biology, but the real issue is they've used it, in my view, to go after dissidents. Okay. That's, that's what I think happens. So to, to here in the United States, what I find fascinating is, if you want to look at some interesting coincidences, 1950s is when the polio vaccine got created, right? Well, what also was taking place in 1950? The McCarthy era, right? So if you think about the history of human health in the United States over the last 100, 150 years, the, in, in the late 1800s, there were massive workers' protests in this country, okay? Everyday working people fighting for their rights. And pe people's names we don't even know, not Democrats or Republicans, not, you know, it was bottoms up. In the 18, late 1800s, we had the Haymarket riots where three American workers were shot. And in commemoration of them, it, it's called May Day. American Workers Day started here. It wasn't a Soviet Union day. And it spread all over the world. Reagan changed it to Law Day. But the reason I'm bringing this up, the late 1800s, that workers' movements demanded, you know, ending child labor, demanded sanitation, demanded, you know, all clean water. That is what led, that workers' movement is what led to all the gains that FDR and these elites had to throw people because they were gonna have a revolution on their hands in the 1930s. So they gave people all those you know, gains, right? Sanitation, refrigeration, and that's when you see the amount of infectious diseases starting in 1900s go from 14 out of 100,000 by the time, even to the 1950s, you know, one out of 200,000. So we had already gotten rid of 98% of infectious diseases, forget medical interventions. We got rid of it because of improvement in infrastructure. Well, where did that come from? Which is what I'm correlating here. That came from people's revolutionary movements. So 1950, so after 
1950, what happened? Well, after 1930, the elites were so freaking upset, they had to give these working people these, this infrastructure, they started calling all of them communists, right? And this is the bottom line that we have. Everyone's a communist if you demand workers' rights. It's bullshit. So in the 1950s, massive, you know, we called all the Red Scare begins, right? Because what's happened is the elites in this country had the fear of God put into them when people bottoms up, rose up, and they got those, that infrastructure. And then, it's, isn't it interesting, starting 1950, the vaccination program starting, right? So I find it fascinating. You're vaccinating the hell out of people starting around 1950. At the same time, you see the destruction of the American workers' movement in this country. There's not been any serious mass movements. You rise up to do a mass movement, you're called a commie, right? So that's what's happened. And I find, so for me, when I look at this vaccine movement, first we've, and you can apply this paradigm. I have a book coming out, by the way, called Climate of Science, which talks about this and a bunch of other issues. We constrain freedom. You eliminate discourse. So in academia, you, you, you get rid of all the rabble rousers. You only get the robots who, know, who can get the grants. So now truth is constrained. And when truth is constrained, you impose, instead of scientific method, you use scientific consensus, right? So it doesn't matter. So 97% of people could say the sun goes around the earth, but one, it doesn't matter that one guy has the evidence it does it, right? That's what we're heading to. And then when truth is constrained, you create a fake problem and a fake solution because the politicians and the lawyer class have become so corrupt, they can't implement infrastructure anymore like we did in the 1900s, you say? So they create a fake problem. Oh, the problem is CO2. We got to lower CO2. That's the problem, not pollution. Oh, it's we got to vaccinate. You and this Agenda 2030. You and Agenda 2030, yeah. and you mentioned the Paris Accords. Isn't that interesting? They want to save us. They want to save the planet from, quote, unquote, global warming, all invented by the Club of Rome, by the way. And right. meanwhile, China gets to pollute their asses off while we have to deindustrialize. Isn't that right. a beautiful, uh, it's just, well, a, it's madness. Well, there's a nice video I have there explaining the entire Paris Accords. I think it's got about 2 million views. It's just not on a pen and a whiteboard. But the bottom line is the Paris Accords incentivizes pollution. And after 2030, China and India will have to buy carbon credits, okay, to offset that. Well, those carbon credits trade on the market, mm -hmm. right? And they're going to be explosive in value. So a bunch of people are going to become trillionaires. The entire thing is a racket. But, and, and, and no one wants to talk about pollution. You know, I think, what, at least 7 million people die a year of air pollution in the world. Right. So we're not talking about pollution. China gets to pollute. India gets to pollute. Um, CO2 is not a pollutant. And if, if CO2 levels go below, you know, 180, all life on Earth dies. So we, we have fake science, fake problems, from, uh, pushed out to the fake media. And that's why I think my running for Senate is going to be, and, and winning is important because it's going to be historic because Massachusetts, the one mile radius between MIT and Harvard is the center of the center of the deep state. And so a guy like me, by all, first of all, a guy like me should never even made it here coming from an untouchable class in India, right? Guy like me getting four degrees should never occurred. And a guy like me who's able to articulate this and educate people is danger. And that's why we need to win in Massachusetts, because I believe my winning in Massachusetts will be equal or bigger than the Trump victory, because it's basically, wait a minute, this guy's one of us. He's a working class kid from New Jersey, and he's speaking for us. So all of your people listening to this need to understand that every elite, every global problem, you can probably trace every massive stock crash of every economic to some professor at Harvard. Every evil starts in the one mile radius between MIT and Harvard. And I know these guys, I've figured them out. And I think my winning is a winning for everyone because no one's ever had an everyday person like me win for them. And I, in many ways, I reflect the founders of this country. And I only want to do it for one term and then go back to the farm. I have enough stuff to do. These law, the legal class has no other things to do. So we live in a very interesting time, but we live in a time of liberation, extreme opportunity for liberation. But we also live in a time of extreme opportunity for the dark ages. And... Um, so <laughs> that's why I'm running for Senate. It's my way of giving back to a country that's given me so much. You're a really interesting guy. And uh, I think uh, any uh, jury rigging or any uh, nefarious activities that were taking place against your campaign, even by the GOP last time you ran, uh, take comfort in the fact that the same exact stuff happened to Rand Paul and 
Ron Paul when he was running for president, completely ignored by the media, uh, completely discounted and slandered at, uh, at every opportunity. Um, I think before we let you go, I would just like to get uh, your thoughts here on the coronavirus. The CDC, well, by the way, the CDC owns patents on these vaccines. I, there's just, yeah. there's uh -huh. nothing more, in my view, nefarious and riddled with conflicts of interests than the vaccine Big Pharma program. And Big Pharma gets blanket amnesty against lawsuits, like you've already cited, and now they want to roll out mandatory vaccines from coast to coast. We the people have to stand up. This has to be the line in the sand. It just has to be. The, it has to be the, the line. I, I and the Second know. Amendment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, when I was in uh, Connecticut, I said, look, this issue of vaccines is not about vaccines. And it's not pro-vax, anti-vax. It's fundamentally about freedom. And it's fundamentally about the state, its final attempt to put a nail in the coffin on setting the fact that what boundaries that they can cross. So once you allow something like this to occur, what's tomorrow if someone puts a camera in your home? The state, well, we gotta watch your kids, right? Where does this end? And I think this is the beginning of a revolutionary movement and it's not gonna be handled by the quote unquote liberal activists. It requires a revolutionary approach and it requires people who are serious, not dilettantes about this. And that's why I keep emphasizing, you know, our campaign in, I don't need to do this, man. I've made a ton of money, you know? I don't need to be doing this. You know, it, it's, it's massive amount of work. Um, and we are fighting everyone. And I'm doing this because, you know, in, when I was 12 years old, and I, the first time I went back to India uh, in 1975, and I remember going back to my village, and I, that's when I realized, holy moly, you know? Uh, these people have nothing compared to the U.S., and I was leaving the train station and I saw my grandparents, I was 12 years old, coming and crying, these amazing people who had nothing. And I said, you know what, I'm going to do something, not only for them, but for all those people back in New Jersey, that if I don't make something of myself, you know, learn knowledge. And I, it, it was this 12 year old kid who made this decision to fight. So I, you know, a revolutionary was born at, you know, in 1975 and that's who I am. And I think it's time people embrace the fact that uh, we are, you know, it's time to be real Americans. Real America was we create our future. You know, it's individuals. Every day when people get up, they make a hundred decisions for themselves without the state's intervention. People have power. They know what's right. Elizabeth Warren doesn't know what's right for you. The state doesn't know what's right for you. Their view is they know better and we don't. And that's why I keep telling you Massachusetts where the, was where the revolution occurred. Our winning here will be a huge revolution like a bomb went off. Think about that, man. A, a dark-skinned, low-caste, working-class Indian kid beating the Boston Brahmins. That's what it's about. And they are the snobs. You know, they, they have, an all, th there's three lawyers running against me. Markey, lawyer, Joe Kennedy, lawyer, and then they just threw a GOP rhino swamp creature against me, right? Because they, they didn't want to clear the way. So it's the lawyers versus the producers. That's what we are. We produce stuff. I make things every day. And it's time that Americans woke up and stopped voting lawyers and stopped voting the political class in. So everyone, if they're uh, crying, you know, they can't be victims because they put these people in power. And, and, and there's a huge opportunity because by winning in Massachusetts, I'm going to tell you, I'm only going to serve one term. We'll set off a wave. People say, holy God, that kid, that guy won in, uh, in Massachusetts. We can win. People need victories, you know, and Massachusetts is the center, the center, the center of the deep state. All right. By winning here, it'll be explosive. Tell people how they can support you. What is the website for your Massachusetts run for Senate and uh, any of your other websites? Yes. Yeah, so people should go to Shiva for Senate. I don't know if, if, you, if you want me to share, I can bring it up. Sure. Uh, yeah. So let me, so, so one site you can go to is um, you guys can go to Shiva for Senate. Let me bring this up here. And Shiva for Senate is our, you know, uh, is our, um, is our website, which is really for the campaign. And if you go there, you know, you can donate, you can get on the bus. Um, we also have a, a, a manifesto, which everyone can read, which really lays out what I'm actually standing for. Um, there's, there's a climate change video. There's got a lot of great content. Okay. So if you want to know, we have a citizen science act that I'm, that we need to completely redo how academic science is funded. We have a thing called the Digital Rights Act, which I've just shared with you, and we have a Health Rights Act, like the Civil Rights Act. Um, if people want to know more about me, you can go to vashiva.com, which is really a great website because people say, Shiva, you don't really talk about yourself. So I just redid this website. 
which really gives people an understanding that I work for a living. Um, it, it sort of, you know, my, what I do is I create the future. It talks about the invention of email. It talks about the fact I'm running for Senate. You talked about clean thing. I, I, one of the things I did was if you go to Whole Foods, you'll see that there's a seal called clean food. I was the one who pioneered that. And it's now on, I think, thousands of products all over the country. Um, you know, I created Cytosoft, SystemSoft, but let me stop this. I don't want to uh, overwhelm people. But the bottom line is um, VA Shiva is a good website to go to, or you can also go to Shiva for Senate. And it'll give people a pretty good idea of why I'm running for Senate and how these are linked. But the core of the campaign is truth, freedom, and health. Excellent. All right. Now, here's the thing. This would be the perfect place just to wrap it up. I get that. And uh, we're going long here. But uh, before I went on that CDC kick and back to vaccines, my last question I wanted to ask you was about the supply chain. So much of the goods, so many of the things that we buy and find in our stores come from China. China is on lockdown right now. Uh, even Beijing, I guess, is being threatened to be locked down. Your, yeah. your view on the state of our economy, if this thing isn't stopped in the near term, if this goes on for a year, if this, I mean, this could be an economic end game for the globe, potentially. I mean, think of the uh, products in a Walmart. <laughs> I mean, are Walmart shelves going to be bare in six weeks? Well, I think you ask a good question. Look, the uh, Chinese, uh, the, the global capitalists, right, be they in uh, U.S. or China or wherever, uh, they don't have any uh, national alliances, right? They invested everywhere. So Walmart's goal is to get the cheapest goods, right? So you have this phenomenon where we, uh, global capitalism and the forces of capitalism were very good at lowering cost. I mean, you could ship stuff from China to here at such efficient rates. So um, I think that entire supply chain um, is obviously important, but we have to look at what is the supply we're getting from there, okay? Um, there's a lot of junk in Walmart. Okay. Right. Um, so I think it's going to be, it's not a bad thing, man. Um, you know, Trump has put policies into move manufacturing here. That's right. I think, you know, I think if you look at the concept of local, right. Um, I've always wondered people buy these toys that last forever, right? Plastic. Well, what about you support your local toy manufacturer here? You know, maybe it doesn't last forever. Maybe it's made of some biodegradable organic material. Right. And maybe, I mean, toys used to fall apart. Right. So, or they, or handmade stuff locally used to last forever, right? So I think this is not all a bad thing. I, I think what's fundamentally happening in my view is that the Chinese working people who've been freaking abused by global capitalism are rising up. And this is what we're seeing. We're seeing a revolution take place in China in my view. And there is gonna be, as you say, an explosive effect, but it's going to be a good thing in many ways to have a chance to reset. I mean, if you look at the economy we have, I was just talking to a, an amazing economist this morning. Much of it is a fake economy, man. It's a fake, fake, fake economy. The Fed controls money supply, which artificially gives people access to capital when it's not even based on anything tangible. So I think a good reset is in order. So I think people should be getting excited in many ways and getting ready for massive change and realizing that what does matter is what you do with your hands and your mind. He who produces stuff, not he who lives off other people's material, like this lawyer and political class. And, and China, you know, has taken massive advantage of its people for a long time. Destroyed their air, destroyed their water, destroyed everything. And I think that's what's really going on. That's the heart of this issue, which we need to really talk about. All I right. think it's all good. Yeah, well, I think I like your optimism. And uh, yeah. I, I concur about President Trump putting in place uh, some policies to bring manufacturing back because, uh, as I've said many times, I think we're real blessed because the Wicked Witch, had she gotten into the Oval Office, would have really uh, put the final nails in our coffin and rolled out her George Soros uh, globalist uh, view of the world in this country. Well, they would have just consolidated power even more. You know, we would, uh, but I think the opportunity we have is Trump, um, I don't know him personally, but what his win was a big hole that was put in um, into the wall, right, of the deep state. And it's, it gives us an opportunity to tear more of it down, and that's what we should be doing. Yeah, so I think, amen. I, I think we live in awesome times, man. I think people should be excited and getting ready to become citizens again. Yeah, well, people can feel it. This great awakening is real. So, guys, let's support Dr. Shiva in his run for U.S. Senate in Massachusetts. I'll leave the link to his website for that below. 
And uh, I really appreciate your voice, your courage. Um, thanks for fighting. Hey, I mean, you're right. You're rich. You don't have to do this. So I really appreciate you fighting for uh, fighting for all of us for well, liberty. I, I earned it, man. I didn't get a fifty nine, fifty million dollar trust fund. Okay. Yeah. So and like you, American people are hardworking people. We have to go back to our roots, which is we create the future. And there are other people trying to control our future. That's what the opportunities we got to get rid of those people and start creating our own futures again. Yeah. I concur. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening. And Dr. Shiva Ayadure, thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you. All right. And guys, thanks so much for tuning in. We really appreciate all of you. For real news 24 7, you can visit us directly at STE.